So the Titan II missile played an important role in the United States' nuclear deterrence against the Soviet Union during the Cold War. It was the main ICBM used between 1963 and 1987. Um, and there were 54 of them and there's only one left on display anywhere in the world and it's here behind me. So in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of both the missile and the bunker around it. So let's go in and see what it's like. I'm Paul Stewart and I usually make videos about planes. But there's now a few rockets and this ICBM. I make tours through interesting aircraft in museums and I fly on board interesting aircraft around the world. If you're into these types of videos then please check out my channel and subscribe. The Titan II was the replacement for the Titan I, which was only in use for three years between 1959 and 1962. It was only ever a backup to the SM-65 Atlas missile, but they decided to put it into production anyway as the Cold War was heating up. But the problem was that the oxidizer couldn't be stored inside for a long period of time, therefore it had to be fueled up just before launch. This could take 30 minutes, so something newer was needed, so the Titan II was designed to be stored, fueled, and launched from under the ground, and all in around 60 seconds. You've got the military police vehicle sitting here on display, although back when this base was operational, there were no crew above ground. Everyone was located underneath, although the military police would be on call to visit if needed, and I'll mention more about security shortly. The Titan II was a two-stage intercontinental ballistic missile, and was designed to deliver a W-53 warhead with a yield of 9,000 kilotons. For comparison's sake, the little boy bomb dropped on Hiroshima only had a yield of 15 kilotons. It was powered by two agents, one called Erizine 50 and an oxidizer called dinitrogen tetroxide. These would spontaneously ignite if they touched each other and were also quite toxic. This here is the hard fuel stand where the Erizine 50 will be transferred from a service vehicle to the missile. Fuel transfers only happened a few times a year as they were always potentially a dangerous time. When this site was operational, there were no crew above the ground, therefore the security was provided by the TPS-39, a transportable radar search system where the radar antennas are located around everything important and create a radar fence between themselves and the other antenna. If anything crosses this fence, it'll activate an alarm down in the control center and then they'll contact the military police to come and visit. Now let's walk over here and have a look at the missile engines. And the first one is the Stage 1 engine. It developed 43,000 pounds of thrust and burned until it ran out of fuel, which was around two and a half minutes, and at an altitude of 50 miles. The engines were essentially just a massive pump pushing 170 gallons per second into the combustion chamber. Now, as I said earlier, the fuel spontaneously ignited when they mix, so no spark was needed. One of four butterfly valves controlling the flow of fuel had an electronic lock, which the crew had to unlock by entering a code. Without this code, the engines wouldn't start, therefore this was an extra level of security to avoid an unauthorized launch. And we'll mention that again once we're inside. And here's the smaller Stage 2 engine, which would ignite after the Stage 1 has completed its job and was jettisoned. This burned for 3 minutes and up to an altitude of around 200 miles. The onboard guidance system would shut it down once it was on the correct trajectory, and it would then also be jettisoned. And then you have these two solid fuel vernier rockets, which would make small adjustments to the direction of the missile as it closed in on its target. And walking further around, we have the oxidizer hard stand. This is where the oxidizer would be transferred from the storage vehicle into the pipes connected to the stage 1 and 2 fuel tanks. And again, this was kept well away from where the Aerozine 50 was transferred, as it was always the riskiest time for an accidental spillage, and you wouldn't want them to be anywhere near each other. Now let's go and have a look down into the actual missile silo. There's actually two concentric cylinders. A bigger one is 150 feet deep and 55 feet in diameter, and inside that there is the smaller launch duct, which is 26 feet in diameter and the same depth. And this is the one that you're looking into. The walls are up to 8 feet thick. Now looking inside, you can see a Titan II, in case you've missed it. And this here is the half-closed silo door. This is the position that I was just standing in, and if we walk around to the side, I'll say more about the doors. They weigh 760 tons, and could be opened in around 20 seconds. It's now locked in this half-closed position, but would have normally moved towards the right of the screen along these tracks. 
These large concrete blocks here are positioned to obstruct it from opening, and they're on full display to Soviet spy satellites to prove that the base is no longer operational. Now let's go and check it out underground. To try and provide some proportions, I'll try and avoid cutting between footage too much, and I'll just speed up during the long walks. We'll enter via the access portal, and these 55 steps are a part of what is called the soft area. This means that in the event of a nuclear explosion nearby, which is a mile or more away, it would create a fireball around 100 million degrees Fahrenheit and a shockwave 35 miles in diameter. All of this area that you're now in would be destroyed, but the area that we're about to enter, called the hardened area, would survive. If the explosion was within a mile, then it would be considered a direct hit and nothing would stand a chance. The hardened area is protected by 4 feet of reinforced concrete on the sides, 5 feet on the roof and ceilings, and 8 feet at the silo, and then it was all covered in a quarter inch of steel. And to enter, there was this 3 ton blast door, which would also be airtight to ensure no radiation or anything else could get through. Remember that this was to protect against a nuclear explosion, but also any potential mischief from anyone else who might want to commandeer the base. Now I'll take a step back again to the stairs and have a look at the door. You can see some of the massive hinges, and these here are massive pins that will hydraulically move and unlock the door. Then human strength alone is enough to open the door. Then we walk into the next section, which is where we find another blast door, and then we're into the cableway, which is a long tunnel connecting the control center and the missile silo. We'll come back to this point, but first let's go and check out the launch control center. This was a three-story dome, although we'll only be going into the middle floor. Above us was the crew quarters, with beds, bathroom and a kitchen, and below us was more equipment including backup systems. We'll check out the launch control center, and there always had to be two crew members here 24 hours a day. Now I'll try and show you around and edit out as much of the other people's faces as possible, although hopefully none are Soviet spies, as I may have blown their cover. Now here in the center you have the two crew positions. The commander sits here, and they're in charge, and then the person in this seat is the deputy commander, who also was the communications officer, and both would usually be between the ages of 20 and 25. So there's a lot of responsibility in these very young people. The deputy would use the equipment behind them to communicate and decode information from the outside world. They were also the safety officer, and they would pencil in on this diagram where all of the crew were located at any one time so that they could be brought back if something was happening. They were also in charge of this 8-day chronometer, which was a wind-up clock that's more accurate than an electric clock. Every two hours, they would call the atomic clock in Colorado and synchronize it so that it was never more than one second off. In front of the commander were three buttons for the three preset targets. These were and still are classified and the crew would never have known the actual destination of the missiles. There would be instructions if the bomb would explode in the air, above the target, or at ground level. At ground level, a lot of the destructive energy would be lost tearing up the ground, so by exploding it a little above the ground, the shockwave would cover and destroy a greater area of the Earth's surface. Now let's run through a missile launch. They would regularly get messages, and had no idea if it was the weather or a command to launch, so I'm sure that this noise would have put a knot in their stomachs. Now the message was coded so they had to decipher it. They'd pull out their pencils and paper and write down the letters and numbers. They'd then double check each other's work to ensure it's accurate. Once they'd identify that it's a launch order, they'd need to double check its authenticity and look in this red safe with two locks, one for the commander and the other for the deputy. There's 45 verification cards in this safe, and if the appropriate card had the same line of numbers and letters at the start of the launch code, then they knew it was coming from the president. The next step is to open the butterfly valves that I mentioned earlier on my tour of the engines. Now here's a cutout of one, and this physically blocks the fuel moving along the pipe, rendering the rocket motor completely useless. Now the code to open this would actually come in the launch order, and that's the only time they would ever see it. It'll then be entered up here, and then the missile is ready to launch. There's two launch keys, and they're seven feet apart, with the idea being that you physically need more than one person to turn them. They're spring-loaded so that you can't turn one and then jump along to the other. Now by this stage, the process cannot be stopped. For the next 28 seconds, the batteries are being charged. This alarm is the confirmation that the solid door has been opened, and this alarm is letting you know that the missile is on its way. 
traveling at 18,000 miles per hour, it will reach its target in around 20 to 30 minutes. Now, after you see it done, it really is quite a simple process and also quite sobering. And a reminder of how fortunate that we are that these missiles have never been fired in anger. Now these springs here, and you will see a few of them around the room, are here because this whole section is actually suspended off the ground. In fact, it can move 18 inches up and down and 12 inches to the sides. The reason being was that if there was a nuclear explosion or even just the missile launch, you don't want this whole area vibrating itself apart. Now let's walk back along the cableway and have a look at the missile. The silo itself has eight levels and we'll be looking from the second level. As well as carrying the W-53 thermonuclear warhead, the Titan II was also used for civilian purposes. Twelve of them were used to take Gemini crew capsules up into space, as well as weather satellites and I dare say a few military satellites as well. Now here on the right are the protective clothing for the refueling process as it was highly toxic. Now one of the benefits of Titan II over Titan I was the ability to keep the missile fully fueled and ready to launch all of the time. But the oxidizing agent had to be stored at 60 degrees Fahrenheit as it would boil away at 70 degrees, which was an issue since we're in the hot Arizona desert. So maintaining its temperature was a very important job. And speaking about the fuel, in 1980 in regional Arkansas, while a crew member was working on the Titan II, he dropped a wrench approximately 80 feet and it damaged the missile, causing a fuel leak. The evacuation began and eventually two crew members re-entered to turn on the exhaust fan. Sadly, an explosion followed, killing one and injuring the other. That 740 ton silo door that we saw before was blown 600 feet away from the silo and the nuclear warhead landed 100 feet from the facility gate. Thankfully, its safety systems all worked to ensure it didn't detonate nor leak any radiation, but it was a scary story. Now here we are looking at the missile, and apologies that my footage isn't great. The black bit here is called the re-entry vehicle. It includes the warhead and is the only part of the missile that continues to the target. Everything else below that falls away. It would re-enter the Earth's atmosphere at 20 times the speed of sound and the surface was made up of ablative material that could burn away from the incredible heat, but keep its integrity to protect the warhead inside. And speaking about that, here is the W-53 thermonuclear warhead. Now it's incredible to think that something so small could be so destructive. It's the highest yield warhead ever deployed in an American missile and around 65 of these were constructed between 1962 to 63. In 1981, the Reagan administration decided to deactivate the Titan IIs and over the following years, the silos were destroyed which the Soviets could confirm via satellites. Only one missile silo was preserved and that was this one. I hope you enjoyed this tour and don't forget to check out my channel for many other similar videos. Please give it a thumbs up and subscribe and thanks for watching.